How are you doing this morning, Amber? Good. How are you guys? Good. Sounds like you're out feeding feeding the chicks. Actually, I have one inside because she's. Oh, I have one inside. It's a yeah. She's. I think I don't know. Do We're trying to figure out what's wrong with her. She's not doing well. Well, no, she walks like a penguin. Oh. <laughs> just weird. And I just. No. Well, so in a minute, Amber, we're going to need you to give us a repeat of the specific question about the healing stuff to get us started. What if I don't remember the specific question? Well, that's why I'm, I'm giving you a couple minutes heads, heads up. <laughs> she can work on that. <laughs> Uh-oh. No problem. Um, oh, man. Yeah. Anyone else remember it? Well, you wanted um, you wanted to talk about miraculous healing, um, and um, and then when questioned um, whether you meant spiritual healing or physical, you said, "Well, I, I think more specifically physical." And you had told a brief story about a, a patient or yeah, someone who you had been talking to about it. So yeah, yeah. I was definitely thinking more physical. I know Bobby's had some pretty awesome stories that I like to listen to, and it is inspiring and also frustrating because <laughs> of yeah, just to see that it's truly lack of faith that that we have um, that keeps God from being able to work the miracles that we could be seeing on a regular basis. Um, so I guess just that kind of idea is where I was at. Okay. So let's see, uh, John, maybe in just preparation what we got here, or anybody else who might know where to find them, we probably should take a look this morning at in matthew the commission which is way at the end of matthew but then there's also the verses about uh, call the elders together um and lay hands on the sick um i think that's james uh, but anyway if someone knows where to look that up, we should probably take a look at that one this morning uh and anything else that you think pertains to the question about miracles uh you know, beyond uh, just the miracle of our thoughts being conformed to Christ, uh, but uh, specifically in physical healing miracle type things. Um, so while we got a couple minutes here, if anybody's got one they could think of adding to the discussion this morning, uh, look it up so you know where to tell us where it's at. What's the date today? <clears throat> so yeah, the the James one is James five uh, fourteen through sixteen. Okay. Matthew is Matthew twenty eight <coughs> eighteen to twenty about. Yeah, it starts and looks like 16, huh? Yeah. What verse is it again? Matthew 28, starting in 16. And I'm going to step away here for just two minutes. I'll be right back.
leader. So I have to ask, um, Uni Kitty. <laughs> I know that's not your name. I'm pretty sure that's not your name. <laughs> it certainly isn't. That's my that's my eight year old. <laughs> ah, okay. She got my Zoom after friends and forevermore. I've known as Uni Kitty. <laughs> I, uh, I can change I'm it Kyler actually. Ryan. How are you? <laughs> Let's see. I'll go figure that out. It's made a good talking point. Maybe I'll leave it. Okay. <laughs> uh, how about if I put Uni Kitty, aka what's your real name? Kyler, like Tyler with a K. Okay, cool. There we go. <laughs> Where where are you uh, coming from? I'm in Walla Walla. Oh, okay. Do you I know Amber? Yeah, I, I okay. know cool. about this. Hi, Amber. It's so funny because Michael's <laughs> like, hey, that looked like Mr. Lang, and I wasn't looking at my phone, and I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm sure it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I Hi. Hi. I, I, I think I there was a oh, group of y'all over at Amber's house one time I went and hung out with, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that Amber? Same group. Yep. Yeah. En enjoyed that group. So. Good. Awesome. Well, we're glad you're here. Me too. Feel free to unmute yourself and make comments and all of that. We uh, we like people to participate. <laughs> yeah, I came one other time. I, I just like listening. It's been interesting hearing. I, I spend my whole week talking. I'm a teacher, so it's oh, a good yeah. change of pace <laughs> hearing what other people have to say. Uh, understood. Understood. But thank you. <laughs> You bet. <laughs> You're muted, Bobby. All right, we ready to start, John? Yeah, I think so. Good to see everybody this morning. Um, let's see, uh, Dad, would you have opening prayer for us this morning? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I can. Okay. Let's begin. <clears throat> Father, this morning, um, we uh, thank you so much for who you are and what we've discovered about you. And it's awesome. And as we begin this, uh, this day, your Sabbath, to open the word, we know we need your guidance to understand it. So direct each of us, each person that we might better understand what you're endeavoring to try to communicate to us. And uh, we ask that you bless today the presence of your angels and your spirit and uh, all together that uh, we can learn and understand you better. Thank you so much for hearing our prayer. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Okay, just in the way of uh, getting started here, let me say again that uh, we're doing a swap. If you got the emails, the topics this, the, this morning was supposed to be the law, or sorry, faith and works. Um, <clears throat> and the afternoon topic was going to be miraculous healings. Uh, and we're swapping those just because somebody that couldn't get on this morning uh, was hoping to be part of the 
the other discussion. So we're going to switch that to the afternoon. So if you're on hoping to do uh, <clears throat> faith and works and don't want to do the healing one, we won't be offended if you hop off now and come back at 2.30. <laughs> also, the other thing uh, about swapping those is usually at the 10.30 session here, we try to use a Bible only. And then the afternoon one, for those of us that enjoy doing it with uh, Desire of Ages and, and other uh, other books, uh, books from Sister White and so on. Uh, so we're going to swap that as well. So we're going to use Desire of Ages uh, in our discussion this morning. <clears throat> um, anyway, just want to let everybody know uh, where we're at with swapping that. So the question on the table, uh, and then I think we'll start with reading together through Matthew 28 starting in verse 16. But the question on the table is about miracles uh, today. Should they be happening? Should they not be happening? Are they happening? False miracles, true miracles? Um, um, you know, why aren't they happening? Maybe if to, in some of our views as we look around us and, and wish they were happening. So anything along that nature, but dealing specifically with physical miracles. Now, the greatest miracle of all is the changed life and the heart change. So conversion, uh, people coming to know the Lord and being uh, filled with his spirit, that's the greatest miracle. Uh, so we, we don't want to leave that unsaid, but we're not going to focus on the heart change today, which we normally are focusing on in all of our discussions. This is more about, you know, laying on hands, healing the sick, um, healing the blind, uh, the crippled, all of that stuff that was happening in Jesus' day that uh, to some of us maybe doesn't look so common now today and why not. <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, let's have whoever would like to take it other than, let's say, John or myself, would like to take Matthew. And uh, starting in verse 16, uh, let's just read through to review our, our, our memories on what is called uh, the Great Commission or the Commission from Jesus to his disciples. We'll start there, and then we'll jump to whatever other verses uh, at first working in the Bible here uh, that you guys want to put on the table in regards to uh, miracles in our day. So who'd like to read for us uh, Matthew 28, starting in 16 to the end of the chapter? <clears throat> Sixteen. Mm -hmm. Verse sixteen. Sorry, I'm sixteen. Don't come Can't see anybody. Matthew twenty-eight sixteen. Yep, twenty-eight sixteen mm -hmm. to the end of the chapter. I can do that. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and train everyone you meet, far and near, in this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. I'll be with you as you do this, day after day, after day, right up to the end of the age. Hey, what version is that, just so we know what you were reading from? That was the message. <laughs> the message, okay, the message Bible. <clears throat> um, anybody's version as you were listening to Amber read it that either noted something slightly different or added or subtracted something that we should make sure we're getting from any other versions. Uh, I just want to make sure we talk about the very end of verse 16. Okay. Or 17, I'm sorry. Verse 17. <clears throat> Go ahead. What are your thoughts there, John? Well, it's just interesting that it it uh, it's saying, but some doubted, right? They worshipped him. It says <coughs> they went up to the appointed mountain. 
I would assume that means the place they were supposed to meet him. And they went up there, and then when they saw him, they worshipped him. But then it adds this weird thing, like, you know, you could almost stop there. They worshipped him. Great. You know, sounds like a good scene. But it adds, but some doubted. Yeah. And it almost, to me, made me think, well, is that why Jesus goes on to make this statement? Well, and it's is interesting, he... too, that at least in Amber's version there, so I was curious if somebody said it differently, it very specifically connects the doubted to not worshiping or worshiping, right? Because it made the comment that they worshiped him, but not everybody, or some mm -hmm. held back. It's like, before you even get into the commission part, it's explaining that some on the hillside that day uh, were fully in. Uh, and then there was some who were, well, uh, we like it, but we're not sure, right? Anybody's version add anything to clarify that more than what Amber read? So was the one that doubted? It says the 11 disciples went up, and, now, and when they saw him, they poured out their hearts. So it's talking about the 11 disciples. <clears throat> so one of them must have doubted. Well, uh, you mean, okay. <clears throat> Uh, so what version were you reading from, Mom? Me? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I have new RSV. It said the 11 disciples. <clears throat> hey, go ahead, read us 16. Oh, yeah, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Yeah, read us so verse 16, uh, 16 and 17 from that version. Now the eleven disciples <clears throat> went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, so it's not clarifying if it is some of the, the eleven, or we don't know if there's other people there yet, at least in these verses. Okay, anybody else got an observation from a couple of verses? <coughs> Well, think, Amplified adds in in the quotes or whatever, it adds that he, it was really him or really Jesus. Okay. Is what they were doubting. Oh, whether it was really him. Yeah. Okay. But I, I don't know. I mean, that might be taking a little bit of liberty. I'm looking at the, the Greek of it. It doesn't necessarily, the Greek doesn't, clearly make that distinction well i think ultimately though if we talk about belief and what they're supposed to be believing in isn't it jesus and that he is who he is i mean it mm -hmm. might be just the question of is he physically really there or is mm -hmm. he a ghost or is he somebody else pretending to be could be those things but ultimately it's got to be connected to um him in the sense of well did he or did he not say he'd be back in a few days did he say he was going to raise from the dead? And if so, did he? Right. So it's still going to be really, even with the idea of some doubted that it was really him, um, that would be mm -hmm. to doubt all the things that he said about uh, what he was going to do, where he was going to go, and when he was going to be back, um, which then also would be connected to, is it really true everything he said about himself and his father, which is going to be the full big picture of um, what belief is supposed to be. In other words, this discussion, even today, is not really supposed to be about belief in miracles. Uh, it's about belief in the miracle worker, which is uh, Christ himself, right? And God yeah. the Father uh, through him. So, so I think there is an important connection to the idea, even if we uh, say water it down a little bit to the idea of just, is this really him? Um, well, I, 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 yeah, go ahead, Frank. I, yeah, I like how uh, the, the version uh, that Amber read because it, it, it mm -hmm. stated something that's not in my New Living or other translations about like he kind of ignored the people, not really ignored the people that were doubting, but went right to the, like, like he's done before in the past, went right to the meat. So he went right to instructing them. Good. So he wasn't getting distracted with their doubting. No. 
or getting on their case about that. He was just going to give them some clear information. Well, I the reason I I brought it up the way I did is because it made me think of when Peter uh, said, "Oh no, Lord, I would never deny you. I would die for you." Right? Jesus did correct him, but he didn't do it in a direct manner like we might with a child or whatever. He didn't say, "Oh, Peter." what's wrong with you? Haven't you figured out that you're supposed to believe what I say? Instead, he prepares him for the mistake he's going to make. And I, I guess I was kind of seeing this fact that the scripture includes that some doubted leads right into Jesus making this statement that he has all authority and all power given to him from heaven. Um, and therefore go and do what I'm you know, going to tell you to do it feels like he's addressing the doubt that is in the group. He is. He is. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's what, uh, as we read. So let's, let's actually switch over to Mark, uh, Mark chapter 16, where the same words about the commission is repeated with a little <laughs> more detail. And even at a different, it appears a different, uh, time and location, but, uh, let's take a look at this version of the same discussion. Um, so we can get kind of to our, our connection to, to miracles here. So this is going to be in Mark 16, starting in verse 14. And somebody else want to read this version of it? Tell us what version of the Bible you're going to read it from. And then take us from 14, uh, probably down to the end of the chapter. I'll do it. Okay, go ahead. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. You said, Get to the end of the chapter. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> These signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven. He sat at the right hand of God, and then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed by his words, by the signs that accompanied it. Okay, good. And of course, uh, after we go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, <clears throat> at the end of each of these books, at least Matthew and, and Luke, or Matthew and Mark, then we go into the book of Acts, where the, the switch actually comes, where unbelief is entirely uh, destroyed or overcome, and then comes really the, the what those last verses just said about, so then after the, the Lord has spoken, they did all these things. Well, they didn't do all those things until after um, Pentecost, but but that was only ten days from from when we're at the uh, trend or the um, ascension, like the, the up on the hill where Jesus is going to ascend into heaven, and these words were spoken. It's only ten days from there to uh, Pentecost, um, so it's not long, but but there is that little bit of time there where the, where there's sort of a completion of this destruction of of belief or faith or lack of faith, sorry, into faith. Um, so anybody got any uh, observations we should grab about the Mark version of what's being said here for our discussion? For sure. Verse okay. 20. Verse 20? I'll just put it on the table, let other people talk about it. Okay. And they went out, these are and they went out and preached mm -hmm. everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompaniment of signs or through accompanying signs. What what's Amber, what's your version say on that verse? In the message? Yeah. Hold on, let me get there. Why she's getting there, the New Living Translation says uh, by many miraculous signs. Confirmed by many miraculous signs? Yeah. Okay. So verse 20, 
20, yep. <clears throat> it actually combines 19 and 20. So it says, then the master Jesus, after briefing them, was taken up to heaven, and he sat down beside God in the place of honor. And the disciples went everywhere, preaching, the master working right with them, validating the message with indisputable evidence. Validating with indisputable evidence? Correct. <laughs> that's wow. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys are you guys are catching what I wanted to focus on there. Yeah. Well, it's, so so definitely miracles, definitely physical signs and wonders, and of course there's a list given here starting in verse uh, 16, right? Uh, sorry, 17. These signs will follow those who believe. And then it gives us the signs, casting out of demons, speaking with new tongues, uh, serpents won't harm them, poisons won't hurt them or cause any uh, death. Um, <clears throat> and they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Does anybody's version make that last part a maybe, like might? lay on hands and they might recover or are all of them very clearly definitively it will yeah mine is it will there's no wavering in it how it's said no maybe to it no nope. <clears throat> anybody's give anything that's sort of a, a maybe Probably I not. have a, I have a, uh, I don't know, an observation of not that one, but in Mark, it's the difference between in verse 18, it, after, after talking, well, in verse 17, it says that they doubted. And then in verse 18, it says he came and spoke to them. And I'm not sure if he's talking about the 11 disciples or just the ones that doubted. You but it's from Matthew. <clears throat> this is from Matthew. Yeah. Um, but it says, all authority has been given to me. And then he says, go. So he's speaking to those, and it seems like he's speaking to both those who believed and, and doubted. Um, well, notice, it, no, notice in the Mark version, it kind of right. jump, it jumps from just the 11 to like at on the mountain where he's going to go up into heaven. It kind of slams potentially two different activities or two different times together. Because in verse 14 in Mark, it says they sat at the table, the eleven. Right. <clears throat> and of course, it has, and he rebuked their unbelief. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith is how he often said that. Whereas um, in, the, in, the, in the New Revised, it says, they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere while the Lord worked with them. So he's still working with them to help them in un unbelief, maybe, <clears throat> and confirm the message by the signs that are coming in. Well, and this is the part we really want to kind of get onto is this question about the miracles. Like, <clears throat> we know they happen in the book of Acts. Um, we know it went so far as Peter even walking by and his shadow falls on the people and they're miraculously physically healed. I think at one there's one story about a handkerchief uh, being taken from a you know that a disciple had blessed or touched or whatever and and laid on somebody and they were resurrected I think from the dead right so so anyway very clear the things have happened and yet uh, in our modern life modern time uh, two thousand some years later we don't actually see this happening in our lives now I don't mean there's not reports of people doing it somewhere around the globe or uh, on some stage somewhere, uh, and whether those are correct or not correct. But I'm really just talking about um, if we are studying and learning the true gospel, um, why is this all not happening, so to speak? I think was the question that Amber kind of was, was bringing up. So someone take us on some thoughts about it. You can use other verses in the Bible. Um, we probably should read the one from James here at some point, but let's just let's just work on some ideas and some some theory here about why is it so clear that this isn't maybe, but this is actual will, uh, and yet we don't see this right now. Um, I, hopefully, this doesn't stray from where you're wanting to go, but 
one of the things that stood out to me in the Mark version is the the taking up of serpents because that immediately made my mind go to the story of Paul being shipwrecked and then washing up on the shore. And there's all those, that, that whole village, uh, I think it was an Island yeah, or at mm-hmm. least a shoreline. Anyway, um, there's this whole village there and they see him. It seems like they're actually a little antagonistic towards him at first. Um, and then this deadly snake comes bites him on the hand he just kind of shakes it off and keeps going and of course that moment is amazing to all of them because he should have died and so it reminds me of what it's saying there that the the word the the message was confirmed by miracles so imagine these <laughs> heathen this heathen village who had really no knowledge of God at all. And Paul shows up and he's trying to teach them something. God needs to get their attention right away so that they'll actually listen to him. If it was just about protecting Paul from a snake, then God could have just made the snake not even be there or have its mouth closed or not be hungry or whatever the case may be. But, it seems the purpose of that miracle wasn't about protecting Paul as much as it was about helping the villagers and confirming the message that Paul was about to give them. So So that, that fits with the last couple verses in both versions, Matthew and Mark about him working, the Lord working with them and confirming or affirming or giving evidence uh, with real power signs and wonders and 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 is that important like like should we expect it in our day was this something just for the disciples or is it something for now as well i have to agree with what john was saying because i think it it's if it's going to if it's going to be used god will want it used to promoting his character or his good news to others okay which if it's means not he- for promoting good news then why would it be used? So part of that, what I what you said was, <clears throat> it's getting used, meaning the miraculous power is getting used, but it has to be God doing the using. Uh, right. To, ser- to, That's serve, part of it. to serve the purpose you're you're pointing at, which is it's to it, it literally says it here was to confirm what with the signs and wonders. Confirm their teaching. Yeah. That's the important piece because there are many who, uh, you know, again, I don't, it's not a finger pointing operation, but just to say false healers uh, in general, the spirit that they're always of is to draw attention to themselves. And it has little to nothing to do with drawing attention to the good news about God. So the version of this discussion that I learned as a young person in Bible class, was that, um, yes, God used these signs and wonders, this power, you know, back when Jesus was here and his disciples after him, but he will not be doing any of these kind of things in the last days before the second coming. Um, is that your guys' understanding or, or that uh, what, you, what you think or uh, you got different, different info than that? <laughs> I don't think I want, Go ahead. I would like to say something, Bobby, about all that. Sure. Um, I think as we look around in our world the way it is today, and it's, I, I believe with all my heart that it's only going to get worse. And I know for my husband and I's experience, to get the medical help that we need <laughs> isn't always available because... Um, they almost write you off when you reach a certain age. Um, they don't, the insurance doesn't want to cover it. The doctors don't want to be there for you, that kind of thing. And the more and more that the message of God's true character is preached out there, and the more that the need arises that miracles are going to be needed, it is going to happen. 
because people are going to be aware of the need, number one, and people that are in the need are going to recognize that we have something or the people of God, the people that believe in his character are going to have something to give. And I, you know, we may not be seeing it on a grand scale now, but I do believe as time goes on that more and more we're going to see it because more and more people are going to be out of work. They're going to be without insurances. They're not going to be able to afford to go to doctors. And who else are you going to turn to? So, so you're, you're, you're thinking it's okay for us to expect that these things are supposed to happen before the second coming. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think we're being told that, this is going to be something that is going to happen. And yeah. are we, you know, are we going to, to be willing to have enough faith in God to recognize when the need is right and, and step into that um, oh. for any of us, any of us that believe that we're sharing God's character, God's love for us. Yeah, can, it's, I, can I throw a wet towel on that? Go ahead, Frank. <clears throat> well, thank you, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, I think that was very good, Dorothy, and I, I agree with what she's saying. But there's so many times that I've even seen, even in our church, where a miraculous healing did not happen, even after the laying on of hands, and then we're told, <laughs> "Well, we didn't have enough faith." And Good. so that, that's a reality of what we have witnessed. Yes. Uh, and, and that's part of this discussion is to figure out, yeah, what is the answer? Why the, uh, how, why not happening? Or why are, if we are, why are we praying for it so hard and it not happening? Cause that's some, some are having that experience. Um, so yeah, that's definitely not just a, what'd you call it? A wet blanket or a wet towel, but it, it's actually a real question. So I think for us, we've got to start with first solving, and I don't mean that any of you disagree with this, but it's a it's a piece of the puzzle has to be solved. Is it supposed to happen or not supposed to happen? Because if I if I believe it's not supposed to happen, I'm not even going to expect it. I'm not going to pray for it. I'm not really going to think it's even a good plan. Um, and the way that that was connected when I was younger was it was usually connected to the idea that Satan would be doing lying wonders which if someone wants to look up lying wonders, at least in the New King James, uh, you can find a, a verse for us about that. But the, 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 the theory was since Satan will be doing lying wonders, then God won't do true ones because it'd be too confusing for everybody to have to have both happening at the same time. Um, and yet uh, that didn't stop God in Egypt, uh, having Moses you know, throw the stick on the ground because Right after that was going to come lying wonders. Uh, that just meant that God was going to have to keep ramping it up until the devil couldn't keep up anymore, right, with his lying wonders. Because after the second plague, the, they couldn't even come up with explanations for the Pharaoh anymore. So <clears throat> uh, that doesn't necessarily tell me that, well, because Satan's going to do lying wonders to Pharaoh, that God better not do a true one. Uh, it's the opposite, actually. God will do true ones to outdo the false ones. Um, same in Jesus' day and the disciples' day, there was attempts at false ones, false uh, miracles, false miraculous uh, attempts at things. We have Simon the magician who wanted more uh, power than he already had over the people with his false miraculous whatevers he had going on, um, and he was denied that. <clears throat> and then there was, uh, you know, the ones who tried to cast out a demon uh, what was it, the sons of Sceva or whatever, whatever that name was. Uh, and the devil said, well, I know Paul and I know Peter, but who are you? Uh, so we do have evidence of false uh, miracles even in Jesus' time. But what Dorothy said is kind of an important piece of the puzzle. The people in Jesus' day had reached points of desperation, meaning uh, there was things that the current medical uh, whatever at the time couldn't solve. Uh, leprosy, they couldn't solve. Uh, demon possession, they couldn't solve. Uh, the woman bleeding for 12 years, she had been to every doctor, it says. Couldn't solve, right? 
So there was many of these things that were exactly like Dorothy was talking about, where when Jesus was on the ground, now things begin to happen to um, bless the people, to relieve their physical suffering. But Frank, Frank is, is right and John about the connection of it being connected to the message that Jesus was presenting. That's going to be our super important part of this formula. Anybody else got any thoughts here before I go on? <clears throat> yeah, maybe our, maybe our message is the thing that needs to change and not, not this uh, pressure of your faith just isn't enough. But maybe if we were to connect it to faith, maybe if our statement that <clears throat> um, the transgression of the law is sin turned to whatever is not of faith is sin, uh, maybe that would help. <laughs> okay, connection to the message. So uh, can we read the one from James real quick, John? Where was that? James 5? Yeah, James, um, that's 5, 14 to 16. <laughs> I'm going to read us those couple of verses, James 5. This is going to connect to the one that Frank was actually bringing up, the, the wet towel here. <clears throat> who's, who's going to read that one and what version are you going to read it from? Probably wouldn't hurt to do 13 as well. I can read it. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, ESC. Okay, thank you, Denise. Yeah. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up and he, oh, sorry. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Okay. So my first question about this verse, <clears throat> everybody look at your different versions that you're looking at. And that part that says right after save, does it also say raise him up or fix him, heal him? I don't know. What, what do the different versions say? <clears throat> Yeah, New King James says, "Raise will, and the Lord will raise him up." Raise him up. Anybody else's? Any other version put it differently than raise him, raise him up. New Living Translation says, "The Lord will make you well." Oh, make you well. Yeah. Remedy says, "Raise you up." Raise you up. <laughs> Okay, because our second question about this couple of verses is, again, does it give it in context of a might, a maybe, or a will? For sure. Do you want to hear the remedy? Sure. Sure. Because I often have the question about, well, if we don't obey the laws of health, can we expect help? And this one says, after asking God to intervene, trust him enough to follow his methods and principles. This will heal the character. And if it is in harmony with the Lord's plan, result in making the sick physically well, and the Lord will raise them up. If the wait, 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 back, back, sorry, back up that, read that last line again. And if it is in harmony with the Lord's plan, result in making the sick physically well. And the Lord will raise them up. If the illness is due to willful deviation from God's design, it won't matter once trust in God is restored and the ill are well again. <laughs> so okay. be sure to admit to one another where you have deviated from God's design and request God's intervention and treatment plan for each other so that you may be healed. So, th so this version um, inserts an if in there, right? And the if is connected to whether you've been obeying or not obeying or, or, or uh, uh, keeping the health laws or not. No. No? And the Lord will, let's see. 
if the illness is due to willful deviation from God's design, it won't matter once trusting God is restored and the ill are well again. Oh, so it's, it's saying it doesn't matter if they're physically well, they still haven't gained uh, salvation. Is that what it's saying? <clears throat> no, it's saying that. Well, I don't know what it's saying. <laughs> <laughs> if the illness is due to willful deviation from God's design, that means if you're not keeping the laws of hell, yep. it won't matter once trust in God is restored and the ill are well again. It sounds to me like if, if the matter. person has deviated out of God's care due to their own sins or, or choices. Uh, choices, yeah, um, but that won't matter in the way of healing so long as when, when they come back to God, they will still be healed. That's the way I understand. Oh, they, they can still be physically and spiritually healed? Is that what you heard, Emma? Yes. Yeah. Well, read 16. I want to hear what 16 says, because I think it goes along with what you guys are discussing. So be sure to admit to one another where you have deviated from God's design and request God's intervention and treatment plan for each other so that you may be healed. The request of a person who lives in unity with God is powerful and effective. Yeah, I think it's putting the importance on the mind before the body. Right. That's what I wonder. So a question about that, and we're going to actually read it in a little bit, but we must ask, because that, that actually goes very similar to some of our, so for some of us, some of our older training. Um, and here's the question. Um, does it require that people in Jesus' time, that people were spiritually healed before they were physically healed? Or does it require no. that if they're not going to accept salvation and spiritual healing, then they would be denied the physical healing. It sounds like it in that version, but I don't believe that's true. Okay. And I'm not exactly sure what that is saying. I'd have to read it myself a bunch here to, I've not worked on that version on these verses, but, but, and, and so we're not, we're going to worry about criticizing what just got said so much as what is the correct understanding. Uh, are, is this thing in James, uh, in, in all the rest of the versions, is this about calling the elders together uh, to lay hands on the sick because they might get recovered, uh, depending on, on the, something, or is it, uh, and they will. I've even, heard, I've even heard people bend it this way. I think this is bending it. When we, because we do this so often, as Frank's referring to, uh, we do something called an anointing service. We go in and uh, they're on the hospital bed or whatever, and we have this anointing, and then it doesn't work. So I've had I've seen people actually conclude that James must mean that they're going to be if you pray over them, lay hands on them, and pray over them, they they will be saved as in the soul, uh, not not the body, not physical. This isn't about physical healing. This is just about spiritual healing and and when it says raise them up it's not referring to out of the sick bed it's referring to out of the grave at the resurrection and so it gets completely disconnected from what's in matthew and mark with the idea of physical power and signs and wonders anybody else heard that before i haven't heard that but what i heard was that <clears throat> If you're not living, or, or if you're not, you know, keeping the health message that God won't heal you. Yeah. But, if, but this said that that wasn't true. That was my point of reading. Oh, I see. You're, what you're hearing out of that version is it's, it's disagreeing with that idea. Right. Okay. Well, good. We might have to, I might have to work on that one some more just to understand that version of what it's saying. But, but the main point would be what all of most of the versions are saying on this topic. Um, so anybody else got any thoughts or ideas related to any of that? I think the one in James here, again, is put in a very uh, clear at will, not a, not a might, not a maybe. And so we do have to grapple with the fact that how come when we get together and pray and lay hands, it doesn't happen. Um, 
I'm not real comfortable with just spiritualizing, so to speak, or um, uh, symbolizing what's in James and turning it into uh, this isn't really about uh, physical miracles and wonders. That does fit with the idea of God won't do them in our time. But this commission, what's your understanding of this commission in Matthew and, and Mark here? Was this given just to disciples in Jesus' time? Or was this really supposed to be given to every follower of Christ, disciple, uh, right down to the end, uh, to the second coming? Well, let me ask a question. When did God ever heal anyone where they could have done it themselves, but he stepped in? Is there any, any time that we're capable of healing ourselves, either, either spiritual or physical? Could I add to that question? Yeah, go ahead, Wendell. Okay, so when in any time does God heal somebody when he doesn't get their permission to heal them? That's a completely different question. Well, that's okay. So we got three, three good questions on the table. Uh, Wendell's was, <clears throat> does God heal without their permission? And John's was, does he heal people when they could heal themselves? Kind of. <laughs> well, okay, I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, there's a number of ways. He, so you and I were talking about the story of David and, and was it Nathaniel or Nathan? Yeah. And I think David was in a position where he couldn't, he couldn't find his way back to God. And, and so God sent Nathaniel with a message that was God healing David in that moment. Yeah, um true the the man in the you know by the pool of bethesda uh you know it said that <clears throat> his condition was in in due in large part to his own sin and he was considered by everyone else around him condemned of god cursed of god and yet god shows up smiles upon him and asks him do you want to be healed or what, what do you want, I think, is the words. Yeah, what do you want? And anyway, I, I, think, I think we make a big mistake when we start to get this idea that, well, you know, there are certain things that you could do to heal yourself. And really, you should be doing those. Because we're going down that, that famous quote that actually isn't in Scripture was, the Lord helps those who help themselves. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> So, well, so Wendell, uh, your question again was, does he heal without getting their permission first or against their will? Um, I think that one should be an easy one. And that is no, he doesn't. In fact, every story we have of him performing a miracle, uh, either they came to him asking or on a couple of occasions, he went to them and asked, do you want to get well? And um, I think the closest one that I, in my mind, to sort of uh, not checking with them first was the the man at the gate beautiful after after Pentecost and and the disciples you know the guys asking them for money and they said well we don't have any money but what we have we give you and it, it literally says they grabbed him and they pulled him up almost as if they didn't wait for him to make a decision and I'm not saying he didn't make a decision I'm just saying it, it kind of appears pretty fast uh, that that this happens, but obviously you don't see anything about the man's response that says this was against his will. So I, I would still conclude that this was according not only to God's will but to the will of the man who got healed, because he was leaping and jumping all over the place, right? So, so I think it's an important, uh, it's a good question you asked, and it's important to understand God doesn't just go around uh, or wave his hand you know, and miraculously heal a whole town without them even understanding what's going on. That isn't the point. Uh, he could do that. He could today uh, just heal everybody. Nobody is sick on the planet anymore. But what purpose would that serve? What, uh, how would that do what we've been reading here about confirming their teaching with those miracles? So it's got to be in connection with the message being taught. What is that message? Correct message, wrong message? Um, and, and the miracles are to establish or to add to and confirm 
that the gospel being taught is correct. Um, so it does include uh, their will, not healing against their will. It's important. I think with John's, John's question about, um, uh, do you want to repeat that so I don't get it wrong, John? What was the question? Um, well, I, basically, the thought occurred to me, and I tried to put it in the form of a question, but the thought occurred to me that that we can't heal ourselves. We like to think we can, and that includes in our own spiritual walk, Good. that we somehow think that we can make ourselves better or fix ourselves or or do something to earn the favor of God. And, and the thing we actually need to come uh, to realize is that we're entirely and completely incapable of it. And that, I think, is demonstrated in the physical healings that Jesus did when he was here. None of those people had the ability to fix themselves. And in fact, the, it's interesting that the man at the pool of Bethesda, when he's asked, he immediately goes to what he thinks the remedy is. In his mind, he goes, well, <laughs> I have no way to get to that pool, which will fix me, right? <laughs> um, and so even in that, he, he is misguided and misunderstanding uh, where healing comes from. So, Well, so let's, uh, we only have a half hour left here. So let me jump to, we're going we're gonna to work a little bit from Desire of Ages here. So those of you that have that, if you uh, take a look at Desire of Ages, we're going to start in page 819. Uh, paragraph four. And uh, I want to say uh, that it should not be a question to us. I'm not saying it's, it's bad that you have the question, but it doesn't have to be a question to us. Uh, does the Lord want to heal and do miracles and signs of power? He does want to. He, he did when he came to this earth. Uh, he did it only during the three and a half years of his ministry, but he did it and he commissioned his, his disciples to continue to do it. And the fact that it is not continuing in the same manner does have to do with the gospel message uh, getting convoluted and destroyed. And so therefore it's not safe to connect miraculous power together with wrong message. That would be, that would be ultimately destroying souls because we, God would be teaching them, look, see, put your attention over here. Uh, because this is the right message when indeed it's not. But we're going to notice this paragraph here just to kind of make that point. <clears throat> so 819, taking it slow. It says, the Jewish people had been made the depositaries of sacred truth. What does that, just that line alone mean? The Jewish people had been made the depositaries of sacred truth. Well, they were the ones who had been given um, not only the writings, uh, but the, the direction from Moses, and uh, God had put his special favor on them. Sanctuary, plenty yep. of miraculous power in their story, right? Yep. All the way from the plagues in Egypt, all the way to driving out uh, nations without them even drawing a sword. <clears throat> so... The whole gamut. Uh, but it is saying they had it. They did have the truth. They might not have had it in their brains, but they had it because they had the history and they had the writings, right? It was written down for their uh, opportunity to know it. Uh, because the next part of the line is where the problem is really clear. But Phariseeism, not the truth, but Phariseeism had made them the most exclusive the most bigoted. What does that mean in the context of Jewish nation, the most bigoted? Everyone else is a heathen and uh, their only hope is to become a Jew. <laughs> oh, so the idea that they were the only ones that were right, right? Yeah. They had the truth as it says, and they believed they had the truth. So they could only, they could be the only ones that were right. Of all the humans, so they were the most bigoted, not just in Israel, but of the human race. Everything about the priests, now it's going to go 
uh, from just the whole nation and Pharisees to actually specifically on the priests. Everything about the priests and rulers, their dress, their customs, their ceremonies, and their traditions made them unfit to be the light of the world. So their customs, their ceremonies, weren't, weren't those actually what had been given them in Leviticus? Uh, I'm chuckling. <laughs> the problem was that they thought it was just for them. They're exclusive. So is it the problem, the list of ceremonies, or what they did with it? Now, it's, course, it's what they did with it. Well, which does include in Jesus' time some additions to the ceremonies, right? They, they didn't have just the original ones, but they did sort of add, like to help God out and make them better or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so they did add to the ceremonies. Uh, their dress, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> the Levites, <coughs> they had very specific outfits, right down to the tassels and the embroidery on the hem. Um, so again, it was dress that had been given them by God, right? Yeah. No, no, nobody's going to disagree with that? <laughs> they thought it made them better than everyone else. Well, and they also did things like they added to it. They mm -hmm. added phylacteries. Everybody know what phylacteries are? These little boxes. Well, I, right. And they yeah. added, but the thing, yeah, the next paragraph is the new paragraph because <laughs> Christ goes to his disciples and explains what the scriptures mean. That's what the next paragraph says. So he's, now he's explaining what those traditions were supposed to be about, and they were supposed to point to him. Okay, good, and, and we'll get there. But before we do, just analyze their, their customs, their ceremonies, their traditions. We have to do this because we have to then look at ourselves and go, are we on exactly what the Lord gave, or have we added? Have we expanded? Do we have tradition? We have our own phylacteries. Okay. Yeah, their phylacteries were these things they wore, you know, and put a little written piece of the law in there. And, and the bigger the phylactery, the more they could add, you know, a list. The list of laws could be longer. And so if you're more pious, you got a bigger list in there and a bigger box, right? And so this was... Uh, they thought showing piety when actually it was just built on self-righteousness and it wasn't even an instruction god had given them ex had given them except he said write my laws where on your foreheads <laughs> on your forehead <laughs> which instead of understanding it in our in the knowledge to know god we turned it into a box you know we have a right. and we put it on the front and we think we've accomplished what God said. That And it, it sounds like, okay, yeah, well, we've heard that uh, before. We know about the flag. But when you think about it, how shallow and how utterly ridiculous that that would be a fulfillment of what God said. Uh, and yet right. they were fully believing they were doing what they were supposed to do. Haven't we done but, that with the Sabbath? Turned it into a phylactery in, in many ways? Sure, because we, we believe we're the only ones actually keeping it. When uh, the other week, last week, we worked on how we're not keeping it at all. Go ahead, Frank. Well, I was, yeah, I was just going to uh, springboard off what he said. We do that with the law as well. Um, and I think we do it with the knowledge of our scripture. We almost pump ourselves up. Well, look what I know in scripture and such like that. And it's not promoting God, but promoting self, my knowledge. We have to be careful. All of those things accomplish the bigotry, right? It's almost like she's, she's made the statement that they're bigoted. In fact, they were the most bigoted of all the human race. Then she's going to define aspects of that bigotry. So the way they dressed, their ceremonies, their traditions, all of those things made them bigoted meaning 
and, and we do this too, because we start to separate ourselves in how we teach, especially when we teach in, in an antagonistic manner towards other belief systems or other religions. Um, and we start to point out that people aren't doing it the way we do it. And all those things, all that accomplishes is a separating act. It's a separating activity instead of making you a part of the world so that you can help the world. You're separating yourself from it, but not in the way that God has asked us to be separate from the world. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, John, instead it's man-made, it's man-made separation. Right. That's why you're a peculiar people, John. Yeah, well, I'm, I definitely fit the peculiar uh, part of that statement. So, but anyway, it's it's what bigotry is. It's it's uh, uh, it's actually very sad because there are so many people, and even in Jesus's time, you know, he said the harvest is plentiful. Um. There are so many people hungering and thirsting for something that's real and true. And we give them dead, dry bones. So to finish the line there, uh, the customs, the ceremonies, the traditions made them unfit to be the light of the world. They looked upon themselves, the peculiar people, as the world. But Christ commissioned his disciples. This is where it starts to turn to the solution. Christ commissioned his disciples to proclaim a faith and a worship that would have in it nothing, nothing of caste or country or creed. We could add creed to that. It would be the same way. Mm -hmm. A faith that would be adapted to all peoples, all nations, all classes of men. Um, this is a real challenge for the Jewish people. They had spent so much time in the mentality that they had the truth, they were the truth, they were God's blessing to the world, and their job was to explain to the rest of the world how to just get onto these ceremonies and then you'll be good, you'll be in. That the idea that there was anything wrong with it was to them offensive, it was to them, they, they, ears closed quick, they just won't hear it. And, um, and I don't mean in any way for us to find a group and start throwing rocks, right? This is not about what's wrong with them that we're reading this about ourselves like ha have we been this are we doing this still are there things in our explanations our statements the way we present our thoughts and our ideas about god to others uh, whether it's in our denomination or outside of our denomination that actually fits this description rather than fits jesus in his pattern this is really where the the main question needs to come because down here Further in, in this same chapter, uh, I'm going to get, get it up here on my phone so I can find it real quick. we got to get to this paragraph. Did, was there more in another paragraph there, Frank, you wanted to touch on real quick before I go further? Or was that the part you were thinking of about the Christ Commission? Yeah, that's part of that. Because he, he talks about, he op and then he said he opened up the scriptures showing that he had surpassed through, had been ordained in heaven in the councils between the Father and himself. So he's basically showing him scriptures to me how it's re all that stuff about, you know, what you're talking about in the early paragraph about uh, the ceremonies and such. They were all supposed to be pointing to him. Yeah, meaning everything that. He was showing them in scripture was proving that he had given them the truth and so the other couldn't be the truth right well, in other words what he was contesting couldn't be because everything he was given was so in desire of ages let's jump down to page uh, 821 paragraph two we'll read just a couple more things here uh and then we're gonna have to bring it to a close we got 20 minutes okay this paragraph says through the gift of the holy spirit the disciples, so not the nation, not, not the church membership, not, not just the Pharisees, right? But the disciples were to receive a marvelous power. Their testimony, that's the, the, the message, right? The testimony about Jesus was to be confirmed by signs and wonders. Miracles would be wrought not only by the apostles, 
but by those who receive their message. Um, then going down a couple paragraphs, starting uh, 821 paragraph four. The disciples were to have the same power which Jesus had to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. By healing in his name, here comes the purpose, the diseases of the body, they would testify to his power to heal the soul. There's the purpose of healing. It isn't just relief from suffering, although for the ones who were sick, that was a huge blessing. But it was to testify, not to force them to accept uh, spiritual healing or conversion, but to testify that God had power to uh, heal the soul. So grabbing a little more here. Uh, we better grab this one here on 822, paragraph 2. It says uh, the commission. Now, the difference between the commission, uh, there's the commission, which is the go and do. Uh, and then there's the power promised to go with the commission. So it's going to talk about two things. The Savior's commission to the disciples included all the believers. It, it included all the believers, here you go, in Christ all the way to the end of time. So there need not be a question in our minds that this was just for them or just when Jesus was here. God intended that this would be something that was part of the experience of the true believers all the way to the end of the time. It is a fatal mistake to suppose that the work of saving souls depends alone on the ordained minister. Yes. All whom, whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel, there's the message, and all who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of souls for their fellow men. Okay, going down a little bit further. Better grab this one on 823. Paragraph three. Uh, first, it gives the Bible quote there about they shall lay hands on the sick. But going down after that, um, for Christ came to heal the sick, to proclaim deliverance to the captives of Satan. He was in himself health and strength. He imparted his life to the sick and the afflicted and those that were possessed of demons. So it includes all of the things there. And this is important, this one here. Jesus turned none away who came to him to receive his physical healing power is what that's referring to now he knew that those who petitioned him for help had brought these diseases upon themselves so this isn't a question about did they keep all the rules or not or did they make themselves sick or not he knew they had brought these on themselves yet he did not refuse to heal them if we have a gospel that says well we have to distinguish between those who really deserve healing and really those who don't. Uh, you're going to be on a wrong gospel. That's wrong, wrong message, wrong teaching, wrong gospel. Because if the gospel is Jesus will heal spiritually, any that will come to him, then the physical needs to match. If you teach a physical that says, well, he'll only heal you if it's his will, or he'll only heal you... Uh, when you keep the rules or join the church or anything like that, then physically you're teaching that spiritual healing only happens that way as well. Yeah, and that says that also in that paragraph, Bobby. It says, and, they, and when virtue from Christ entered these poor souls, they were convicted of sin, and many were healed of their spiritual disease as well as their physical maladies. Which also means not all, right? Correct. Many. Says, yeah. So, so it has to allow for the not all. But the encouraging part is, again, the purpose is being fulfilled. The purpose of the physical is to point to the spiritual and to encourage towards the spiritual, convict towards the spiritual, and to accomplish the spiritual healing. That's the bigger miracle. So then for us, we got to pick up this last line. The gospel still possesses the same power meaning now, and why do we not witness the same results today? That, that's the question that we actually started with. Because go down to the next paragraph. Christ feels the woe of every sufferer. When evil spirits rend the human frame, Christ feels the curse. 
when fever is burning up the life current, he feels the agony. And he is, I love this, he is just as willing to heal the sick now as when he was personally on the earth. Anybody got any thought or question about that part still? Uh, it sure sounds like there's a lot of willingness on God's part. So let's jump down then. Our last one we're going to read here, um, unless someone else has got more they want to add. 825, paragraph 1. <clears throat> I'll, I'll add. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, I think you need to add that Christ's servants are his representatives. And I like how she words it, the channels for his working. Exactly. Not our working. The, we're the channels for his working. So you're, like, you're like the pipe. Right? Yeah. The exactly. water flows through. Through. Exactly. You're not the well. You're not even the pump. Just nope. the pipe. <laughs> I just like there how that's worded. There is another aspect to this, Bobby, that, and and I, um, I'm just thinking of the chapter, the true sign. Okay. So there is the aspect of the cavilers and the, and the haters, who will demand a sign, to prove, that you're from God, and, and it's important to note that Jesus never, uh, performed a miracle. Uh, under demand. Good, and that one actually is, that whole question is worth uh, spending a good amount of time on, which we won't today, but but there is that aspect in there where Jesus did not do signs uh, upon request or demand. Um, but let's go, actually, I gave you a paragraph, but let's back up just one sentence, because this is valuable. It says, the very essence of the gospel, so the message, uh, is... Where are we at again? Well, so we're, I'm, I'm actually in paragraph 824, uh, sorry, page 824, paragraph 5, but okay. just the last sentence of that paragraph. The, and then we're going to go into the next paragraph that follows. So the very essence of the gospel is, so that's the message, is restoration. And the Savior would have us bid the sick, the hopeless, and the afflicted take hold upon his strength. So that's the invitation. The invitation is it's about restoration and grab a hold of him because he has power for restoration. Ooh, read the next sentence of the That's next where, paragraph. Where we're going. Okay, good. <laughs> the power of love was in all Christ's healing. So this wasn't just kind of walking around and kind of kind of caring about people, but showing off miracle power. No, the power of love was in all Christ's healing. And only by partaking of that love through faith can you, we, be instruments or, or pipes, conduit for his work. If we neglect, so this isn't talking about the one getting healed. This is talking about the one who wants to be the conduit or the channel or the pipe. <clears throat> for those ones, uh, if we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. So as you ponder that for a second, does that mean it can't flow through somebody else to the people? I'm, I'm picturing one of those anointings where people are gathered around, and I feel like that's done in Christ's name, you know, there's always a prayer. There's always asking for his presence. There's always um, the love because it's always people around. So what are we still missing? <laughs> well, <clears throat> when we, if, if you've ever been part of one of those, uh, I'll have to ask a couple of questions. When we do it, are we doing it with that kind of assurance, surety that it is God's will to get them out of that bed? Or are we sort of wondering? Are we hoping, but not sure? Are we praying, Lord, we don't know what your will is. We hope your will is. Please do this. This is what we would like, right? Versus, we don't have any silver and gold, but we have this. Get up and walk. I mean, that's, that's a totally different problem. I've never seen that. Don't, uh, Bobby, don't we connect that to Jesus' statement in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, 
uh, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Well, yes. <laughs> the confusion, but the confusion there is that we're assuming Jesus doesn't know God's will. Right. And that, that's an assumption because he does know God's will and he knows his own will in that moment. And he's just I, simply putting his hands into God's will. He's not saying, well, I'm not really sure what God wants in this situation, but right. that's where we go off track from Christ. Yeah, we use his words to band-aid our unbelief. Our, and, I, yeah. I, and again, I don't mean that what's missing, Amber, is the belief in the miracle. Uh, God is not asking us to have more faith in miracles or the miracle. Uh, but but if we take the, and let me finish this paragraph and then I think it'll make some more sense. If we take the, they were the most bigoted, they were um, not representing the truth, and yet they had and had been given the truth. <clears throat> and then we ask the question, yes, yeah, so why wasn't God doing miracles through the Pharisees? Well, that would make sense to us. Uh, so, but we don't like to conclude that, well, we must be more like the Pharisees than, than like Jesus. Uh, and that would explain why we're not having it today. We don't like that answer, but watch what this does. The power of, of love was in all Christ's healing, only by partaking. If we neglect to link ourselves together in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. There were places where the Savior himself could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Now, don't get distracted with what didn't they believe or well, all that. Just look at this next line. So now, unbelief separates the church, whoever you think that is, the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon reality, her, sorry, her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. <clears throat> and uh, we could conclude right there and say, so man, yeah, <clears throat> we all need to spend some time in prayer on Lord. What do we even need to get or understand or have changed in our thinking and our doing? Uh, because if that's true of us, that we've neglected somehow to be linked and therefore the life giving energy cannot flow and therefore, it's stopping the people from receiving the blessing and even uh, stopping God's opportunity to show his glory and his power. Uh, we should maybe skip lunch and pray about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next paragraph is where the answer lies. <laughs> okay, go ahead. It is in doing Christ's work that the church has the promise of his presence. Go teach all nations, he said, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. To take his yoke is one of the first conditions of receiving his power. The very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. And I would add my own thought to that. Where there is Phariseeism, which always tends towards self-focus, it always tends towards how do I look to others or even how do I look to God? And instead, what God is inviting us to do is take our eyes off ourselves and put them on others who need help and who need to be loved and who need to be cared for. And he is promising that our faith will grow, that he'll give us power. All those promises are available, but until we're willing to put down our Phariseeism, our lukewarmness, our Laodiceanism, and, and really desire to do his work, uh, I think he's just waiting for that. And and as she said earlier in that in that paragraph, um, he's being robbed of his glory. God is the one being robbed. So 
Yeah, Desire of Ages 825.4, just a further down. That's a powerful paragraph right there, too. Hi, Frank. You better read it. <laughs> well, it's, it's a really long one, but in the middle you got five of it, minutes. <laughs> in the middle, it, it says, Angels marvel at man's shallow appreciation of the love of God. Hmm. And it, 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 it's, a, it's a very long one and, on how here we, we promote God, yet we look at our fellow people and we don't help. So yeah. just, in, just in conclusion, because that's a lot of heavy weight. It um, is. For all that, which is good for us. But then let us review just for the last few minutes here. How in the world did these fishermen go from where they were in the boat to the book of Acts? And, and really, here's what it was. <clears throat> They were excited about the Messiah. The wrong Messiah, but they were excited about the Messiah. What I mean by wrong is the wrong understanding of what the Messiah would be. Uh, but they did see Jesus, and they were willing to learn, and they were willing to listen. And so they did what we call follow him. But, but don't just think of that as walking around in circles. This is follow to know, to understand, to listen, to hear, to learn. They followed him, slow to get it. But even while they didn't get it, they were excited enough. Uh, I like how it describes how uh, the disciples would help the sick come to Christ. Now, they're, so they're not at first doing the miracles. They're not in the book of Acts yet. <clears throat> they might even have gone out for a few days and done the tour and, you know, where he had named the 12 or the 12 and then the 70. And they might have cast out demons and all that for a little bit. But, but after that, they still, they weren't, it was Jesus doing it. But they were involved with helping. They're bringing the people. Uh, hopefully they're encouraging the people, but we know sometimes they weren't. They were discouraging the people, like the obvious example is the little children, where Jesus had to remind them, hey, don't get in their way. Uh, let them come over here. So they were getting it and not getting it and learning and bumbling along. To me, that's important to, to review because that's what we do. That, that's how I see my life and my experience where I'm getting some stuff and I'm running. And then I find out, well, wait a minute, I ran a little bit the wrong direction. So then we got to back up and uh, get some fine tuning and, and then run again. But this is what the disciples were doing. They weren't, they weren't overwhelmingly discouraged through those three and a half years with this idea that, well, I guess we got to work on getting perfect before we can participate in miracles. They, they weren't even thinking about that. In fact, they were thinking about who's first in the kingdom and having arguments and discussions with one another, but simultaneously they were saying, Jesus, could you explain that parable to us, right? Could you tell us what you meant by that? So they were learning and they were growing. Uh, and we got we to gotta include this one where after they had been out and they had done miracles uh, of themselves, they had seen demons cast out at their command and sick healed. Then, then they came this, to the story of where the, the dad brought the boy. And Jesus was up on the hillside with Peter, James, and John, but the rest of them were there. And the dad said, you know, can you cast the demon out of my son? Please help my son. So they tried, and it didn't work. Now the father's very discouraged. The father, what little belief he had come with, kind of just got shattered. Uh, but Jesus comes down the hill, knowing really all along, because his father had uh, informed him about what was going on down there, <clears throat> He looks at the scene, he assesses the situation, he sees the boy, he sees the father, and he sees his disciples. All that's very nicely described in Desire of Ages, but <clears throat> what he sees. But nonetheless, he sees it, and he says to the dad, uh, you know, what, what can I do for you? And the dad says, if, if, not much belief there, not much faith, it had been shattered. Jesus came to the world to give faith, to give the gift of faith, to give the evidence that faith could be placed in, meaning trust, right? And so he wasn't there to test the father to see if the father could believe enough. He was there to show the father his power so the father could believe. And that's how that story actually went. Disciples watch this. Afterwards, they say, Lord, why could we not drive him out? Now we're right at the point that we were reading in Desire of Ages. It literally said in Desire of Ages, because of their unbelief, uh, because of the church's unbelief, because of our unbelief. The disciples hadn't gotten to Pentecost yet. 
they still, even when they went out and it worked, they still were in the midst of a lot of unbelief. They were not believing exactly correctly yet. And so God was working in this story about the, the demon-possessed boy to, to sharpen, to clarify. So he points the disciples to the need for fasting and prayer, which don't, don't conclude that that instantly means you're supposed to go without food. Fasting means uh, first, it could include food, but it first is about stopping relying on ourselves. Fasting from our works, fasting from our food, from what we can do to take care of ourselves and feed ourselves. Fasting and prayer. Prayer is communing with God. Put our trust and dependence in God. Because he knew the disciples would have to have that experience, even though he also knew they would not have that, that experience until the 10 days leading up to Pentecost. Those last 10 days is where that really started to kick in, which you can read about in the book of Acts. And that fasting and prayer, or as it says, they, they put away their differences. They realized that love was more important than all the ceremonies and all the laws and all the rules. Love was the fulfillment of the whole law. And that became their focus. That became their message. They, they stopped being distracted with all the other discussions and arguments going on. And they focused on one thing. This is Jesus. This is who he was when he was here. This is what we witnessed, what we tasted, what we handled, and what we know to be true. And, and that became their focus. And as they were focused on that for 10 days, they were filled up like, like, like glasses, empty glasses being filled from a pitcher. And at the end of that 10 days, the pitcher was pouring and the, and the cups then became over full and they poured out. The Holy Spirit poured out of them onto the people around them. And that's where they became channels or pipes or tubes for God to work through which is exactly the description we read in Desire of Ages. So I'm, I'm trying to point out that Desire of Ages is really only helping us clarify or telling us to look back again at the story, how it worked, what happened, what did the disciples learn, what did they experience, what did they go through. And God desires greatly, deeply today, as he did yesterday, but, but we didn't let him do it yesterday. He's, he's deeply desire, desirous for us, to come into unity with him, to have that experience so that he can work his working miracle power through you. That, that's the facts of what we just read. But it's not safe for us to have him do that while we're still floundering around about what's the message again. And so the disciples were learning that message and running with it, even though they didn't understand everything that was coming. Don't get focused on praying hard enough to get miracles. Focus on knowing God enough that you're letting him work fully through you. And when, when he accomplishes that, he will turn on what is needed next, which is the, the miracle power. So that's the conclusion of the theory part of this. And um, I, I think there was more Amber was hoping we'd talk about, which we maybe can do a little bit after we have prayer here and let those go who want to go um, talk about uh, maybe some practical experiences on this if you want. Uh, more more to study on this, but please do. Please study it out. Reread those things in, in Matthew and, and, and Mark, Luke and John, and really understand that what God wants to accomplish before the second coming is a delivery on the earth again of the clear gospel about God, who he is, his character, along with a display that God will do of his power that goes along with that message. Uh, don't, don't get panicked that the second coming is happening next week because this has not happened yet. It will happen, and he's inviting you to be a part of that, but uh, it's a super important part, piece of the puzzle that needs to happen before the second coming. <clears throat> so let me have a prayer, and then we can chat a little more, those of you, if you got time. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that um, you lived this in front of people so that we could read about it, so we could understand what, what you gave to your disciples, what they learned, how they learned it, <clears throat> so that we could grab onto that and ask you to increase our faith. Uh, not faith in, in miracles necessarily, so much as faith in you, who you are, what you represented, what the truth is, 
so that we can learn to give a clear, not mixed with deception and confusion uh, message to those around us, to the world, so that they might really see through a theory, through theories, what your character and love is like, that they might reach up and grab a hold of it and taste it and know that it is good. So we thank you that that is what you call us too. That's what you call all those who want to put uh, your name on their foreheads. That's what you call us too. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I wanted to go kind of faster to get a whole bunch in there at the end. <laughs> so anybody want to <clears throat> add to that comments or questions more? Wanted to mention a symmetry with something John said earlier okay. that in our bigotry, we offer dry bones. Do you remember that statement, John? Yes. Yep. So the, the symmetry has to do with the miracle working power that was performed in Egypt. And then after the amazing epic opening of the Red Sea, right? Uh, shortly thereafter, you know, the very people who witnessed and <clears throat> valued to some degree the miracle power, they were right back to idolatry. So I think today in the modern church, the, the miracles, the crusades and that kind of thing does produce a different type of idolatry. And that is one of coming to worship in, within the, the machinery that produces bigotry um, that, that concept at least that we're better, you know, come here, you know, every aspect of what we do is superior. Um, the, it's, it's the worship of programs, of people, um, of many different things um, that have to do with um, things that are man-built. So, so every time that there's incredible miracle working power, God risks being misunderstood that the power means something um, other than I'm trying to get your attention but still the the decision making you know choose you to stay who you'll serve that kind of thing is sometimes not related to a miracle, but maybe more sort of like a small still voice. So um, there is that dynamic about him being misunderstood through these things and the idolatry that, you know, predictably comes after that. Yeah, good one. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, um, you know, that cycle is seen again and again and again. Um, and the only thing that I can see that might be different in the last days is it's going to continue to such a degree that it'll it'll bring everybody to fully one side or the other, either fully idolatry or fully uh, surrender to God. And and miracles is one little piece of of what needs to be presented, right? Again, the the purpose of it, as we read was to put the focus on the message. So uh, someone will ask, well, what about all these, you know, performers and things on stage and faith healers and all that? And, and really the question needs to be, what is the message that they're, that they're presenting? Um, if it's a false gospel, God is not going to attend a false gospel with uh, his power of healing. And I, that might be a little bit simplistic. I know usually people got real complicated uh, deeper questions on the subject, like they may have known somebody who went and got healed. And okay, so so all I know is in a simple, basic format, when the truth is in attendance or the truth is being presented, then the Holy Spirit will add to that what is needed. Now, so the point isn't that we pick and choose what's needed, uh, like 
like how did how did Paul know that what was needed that day was a snake to bite him? I mean, you know, he it wasn't his plan, but God knew, and God had the plan all set up, and God had what was there to to make it so the people would uh, suddenly start being able to believe, right? And so so God's really the the miracle worker or the power behind it all, and it does need to stay in that context. Um, I don't think we need to you know go out there and put doubt in everybody's mind all the time about whether the story they heard about a miracle or the miracle they think they uh, experienced themselves is false. Uh, I don't think Jesus spent any time teaching the woman who was bleeding for 12 years that, well, the problem was she was going to all the false healers. Uh, she already knew that it didn't work, so he didn't even need to discuss that. But when she came to Jesus and touched his garment and she was healed, she knew that was nothing like she had ever been to or through before, and that solves it, right? So, so pointing them to the true character of God, the right understanding of God, which starts to awaken the soul, uh, and, and as the Lord leads his disciples and adds to it power of miracles, they will coincide, and they'll uh, serve the purposes the same as it did in times past. <clears throat> Bobby, I remember... I don't know if it was our private session that you mentioned this or if it was on a Zoom meeting, but you had said that Ellen White had suffered for whatever her health conditions were and that they would do a lot of prayer circles around her. And then one boy stood up and was like, I've had it. <laughs> You're healed or whatever. Like, is that, I've been thinking about that during this discussion and so is that an example of the wrong message like they're doing these prayer circles it's not working until the one person stood up and said i know god's going to heal you so you're healed well so so that's a good uh observation about our history if you're talking about adventists um it is good to understand that miracles actually did happen in our early history um you can read about those in in places like testimonies and letters but I think to answer your question specifically, we were coming from the wrong perspective on a lot of things, um, not just understanding about God and character of God, but even the methods that God wanted us to use to preach the gospel. For instance, we got very lost into sort of the power system of politics or church politics or structure, uh, which we're now deeply entrenched in. Uh, we got confused about uh, something called formalism, uh, meaning we had been very formal people that very stringent and sort of, you know, stiff-necked, only could, you know, operate God's truth this way. And so, yes, we were coming out of, like uh, the disciples, a bunch of wrong ideas and wrong beliefs. However, the prayer circles were not the wrong idea. Uh, except that that was a beginning. That was sort of like baby steps. So what she's referring to is I had mentioned that uh, early in our history, Sister White had, was very ill a lot. She had been hit by that rock when she was just a kid, and all her life she suffered from a physical ailment, which was a blessing to her, she said, because it kept her dependent upon God. She couldn't hardly get very far with her own physical abilities and strength. And often it was the case uh, different scenarios where she would be a uh, deathly ill, they would call it in the, in the records of the history. Um, and they would pray asking the Lord to give her strength so she could, uh, present something at church or at meeting, they called it, um, or whatever. And, and they would just see this happen. They would see God doing this, not just with her, but with other people as well. Um, me remember back in, in the 1800s too, um, the life, uh, span was very short compared to now. I think 40 was the average uh, lifespan back then. Uh, health was very uh, disastrous. Uh, didn't have the cleanliness understanding that we have now. Um, a, a huge need for uh, understanding some things about food back then. Um, she had all that kind of mixed together. But specifically the story that Shady's referring to that I told was after this had happened multiple times where the people would get together and they'd pray uh, sometimes for quite a while, and then God would um, strengthen uh, Sister White or heal her physically so that she could do whatever the work was she was supposed to do. Uh, 
there was a time when they were praying and like they always had done before. Only this time, nothing was happening for quite a long time. A couple of hours, if I remember, or something like that. Until finally, uh, it says a young man. So there was a young man in the prayer group of, of quite a few people in the house there. But a, a young man stood up, walked over to her, laid his hand on her and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, be well. Now, they hadn't done that before. There was no story in our history up to that point where we had gotten that bold or that, I don't know what you want to call that, but that clear cut. And so it was uh, like God was trying to advance us down the road like he did his disciples, where things worked, but then he's going to teach them more. And so they don't work, uh, just like in that story with the, where they couldn't cast out the demons. And the point of it isn't that a certain method is the correct method. Like if you just do this method, it'll work. That's not the point. The point is they were needing to grow in their faith, grow in their understanding, and God was training them down the path of being able to do out there what the disciples and Jesus, so Jesus and the disciples after him did, which was to present a clear message and to be able to, with uh, strength of belief and not, like it says, you know, if you believe without doubting, um, <clears throat> to be able to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. So this was um, our early invitation into this subject that later uh, Sister White wrote to us, meaning Adventists, that I've been shown that God can now not work in these ways, meaning miracles. Um, now, I learned that quote as related to the second coming, meaning it's going to be too confusing with false miracles, so God won't do true miracles. When I looked that up, that was not what she was saying. She was saying that because we had turned away from where God was leading us in the path of knowledge and truth about the gospel, i.e., we were rejecting righteousness by faith, then that, that miraculous attendance uh, could not continue because now we were running off on legalism, uh, curse of the law, and, and, and God would be providing miracle power to go with that message. And so that ceased in our uh, denominational experience historically. And it has not turned back on in, a, in a, a way, big way like we see it in the book of Acts, because we're still struggling to get out of that mire, that uh, quicksand I was calling this morning with John, about uh, our struggle with, with legalism and or now, really today, we've got two things going on. We've got legalism on one side, and we've got such liberality on the other side that sin doesn't matter. All within this, our ranks, right? So, so both are a problem. One is Pharisee, one is Sadducee. Um, and none of that is the message God wants delivered. And so what he gave his disciples by what he did every day, all day long, where they could watch him and see him and hear him, he gave them a totally different uh, picture of what the message was. And it was when they got that, that, um, that then Pentecost actually occurred for them. That, that helps, Shady? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, so it wasn't just that it was a wrong method to a right method. It was about taking us down the path closer and closer to uh, how God actually does it, how he wants us to cooperate with him in doing it. Is there a linkage to the... I guess the, the environment of healing and, and I explain it like this, that I've been both in the audience to receive healing and I've been on the stage with the healer or healers um, in a coordinated effort through music. That was my role. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, would, would we get a different result if no offering was taken? Mm in the service first offering second offering third offering that's is that way. possible and that's how they did it was they had three offerings. yeah okay well i mean i've i've seen i i believe i've seen up to three hmm. um at least one but up to three yeah 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 and, and i'm not saying i'm not saying receiving um resources is wrong i'm not saying right, right. that 
Right. But I'm seeing the the rationale behind these um, a lot of these tours, if you will, which I was part of, is that this is the this is the profession of the person. This is what they do. Not unlike maybe an evangelist or right. you know something else, right? So um, I think you know maybe there's something mechanistically about freely giving, freely receiving. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, if to me, when the linkage is, uh, is altruistic and there's like no quote unquote strings attached, right. Um, then it's a different dynamic. And I think the recipient who's requesting healing, um, might be, be able to, uh, have a different disposition than a fee for service. You know, uh, I would have a copay fee if I went to a doctor. Right. So is this doing that where I give an offering as sort of my copay? So that, you know, that's, so, that's an awesome observation, Wendell. And I appreciate your uh, having a different background of experience to that question than I do, right? Because I haven't been on that stage. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that's actually, so all I want to do is, is affirm yes. Uh, mm -hmm. to your question that yes, it would make a difference, but let's expand that to everything that that could relate to the true or false gospel. In other words, the one you're identifying is yes, Jesus said to the disciples, freely you receive, so freely give. It would have been completely wrong for them to charge or even collect offerings if it was related to this is how you can get healed or or more likely to get healed or just the fact that we came here to heal you, uh, now we're going to give an offering appeal. That would have been entirely wrong. Jesus never did it. Not one person ever paid for a miracle or, or even uh, was charged offerings or, or accepted offerings before or so that a miracle would occur. Not one time. Uh, we do have the story with the Simon guy who wants to buy this power and emphatically was told, you, because you thought you could buy it, you can't have it. I think that would apply also to coming for a miracle. Let's say that the woman, you know, bleeding 12 years had come and told Jesus, look, I, I scraped together the last of my savings and all I got is two mites. But if you'll, if you'll heal me, I, I want to give you this. Or if it was any way connected to that, a similar um, clear statement would have had to have been made by Jesus to qualify that, no, 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 this is given to you free. Uh, so I think, yes, you're right. That is a very important connection. But then let's expand that to everything that we do and present or decorations that we put up or, I mean, everything as we're presenting the gospel as to whether it shows correct gospel or not correct gospel. I think the very fact, if I were, for instance, I don't do this because of my conviction on this, that to, to charge uh, to teach the gospel, uh, to, to charge money to go somewhere to present the gospel would be as incomplete of a violation uh, as we were just describing about physical healing. Uh, because Jesus said, if you freely receive, freely give. And since I, pay, I didn't pay for my education uh, that I used to present these ideas all the time, it was given to me free uh, by God through the Bible. So, um, it would be wrong for me to charge. That's my conviction. Uh, and I think that that's very important. But we have many other things. You notice on that list from Desire of Ages, it says their dress. So the way they dress, um, their ceremonies. Their, I mean, th that's, that's kind of all-encompassing what we do for church. church. Does it present correct gospel or wrong gospel? And I think all of those things are super important as it relates to presenting the right message so that the power of the Holy Spirit can attend it. Frank, Frank has an interesting book, for instance, he shared with me years ago. Uh, it's called The Pagan Christianity. It challenges some things that I wouldn't have even thought of challenging. And it has to do with the way that our building is set up. And the fact that the pews are all facing one way, and there's a raised platform, and there's a speaker up higher than all the rest and dressed supposed to be nicer than all the rest. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff that's tradition. And, you know, 
when I think of pagan Christianity, I didn't at first think of, of where I grew up. I was thinking, well, yeah, that'll be about that other big church, right? Uh, but, but as the book sort of laid out the origins of the raised platform, why is it that way? Why is the shape of the building the way it is? Why is the ceiling so high compared to, um, you know, our house? Why uh, do the pews all face the same way? It was challenging my, my, all my thinking about, wait a minute, you mean this was all designed on purpose to present false gospel? And the answer is yes. And yet we still do it and participate in it and go to it uh, and, and somehow think we we got the remnant message going on. So well, that's, that's why I like Sabbath school better. Yeah. We're chairs around each other. To me, that's more of church. And like I said, if you want a discussion on church, uh, the gospel, well, not the gospel, but the Bible he teaches that. The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. And there's nothing wrong with a, a good sermon either. I mean, Paul, given such a good sermon, they went so long, the kid falls out of the window, right? Yeah, however you think that story went. <laughs> Meaning it wasn't Paul being droning on and boring. Um, but anyway, the point is nothing wrong with the good presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, but Paul was not in any way, in fact, after his Pharisee life, later he also went around, he calls it in rags and in chains. Uh, Desire of Ages says that the, the disciples were uh, often uh, found in travel-stained clothes and in servants' clothes. And you say, why? Because they were presenting Jesus. And they were befitting themselves in every aspect of their life to present the Jesus that walked among them. And yet we know, uh, for instance, if we put uh, think of just a, a picture, an image of something up on the wall that supposedly represents Jesus. It doesn't always really represent him very well or correctly, right? So, um, yeah, I won't get more specific about that right now. <laughs> but, but the presentation of, and, and here's where it gets to. We could make a whole new list. See, this would, this would be our nature. We would tend to do the works of the law, uh, to do our dead works, which is to make a whole new list. Well, you should wear this shirt that pair of pants and that pair of shoes. And now, you know, walk out on the street and do this and do that. And we can have a whole new version of some list. That's not the point of this discussion, <laughs> or at least my point. The point is, as I said in Desire of Ages, when we link ourselves or connect ourselves with Christ and are, are, are formed in his image and character and spirit, then what we do outwardly will start to match that character and spirit. And that love from God will start to flow through you as a channel, like, like you're the pipe, the tube through which it flows, onto the people. And God will attend that with both power in the way that he uh, moves you to teach or speak or, or whatever word you want to use for that, to present, to help, to bless in information. He will inspire that. He will use your mouth. Uh, to speak the words he wants spoken. But he will also attend that with miraculous power uh, when that message is, is being presented the way that he needs it presented. And to me, that's a, a nice fit together. Well, to go with that, that's why I was going with 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, because 12 talks about the spiritual gifts. 13 says, the gifts without God or without love, which is the same, are useless. That's right. So I like the question, Wendell. It's a brave uh, question for us to ask at about any level. <laughs> because we have so much of our, what we do, really is built on selfishness, but we try to throw a garb around it of righteousness that it ends up uh, being a stench in the Lord's nostrils. <clears throat> so there's one more thing I was thinking about in terms of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And there is a linkage, of course, to choice where, where there's no freedom or liberty, there's no love. So I've asked many friends, can you give me a verifiable healing 
of a person with a cardiovascular disease an instantaneous healing or maybe you know over a week or something like that where they didn't do any change there's no subscription to galatians 6 7 about sowing and reaping it just happened to them they went to a thing they got prayed for and boom the blood pressure problem went away you know that sort of thing any cardiovascular issues and you know no one's been able to tell me by medical record yeah person is healed by the by the fact that the blood panels look this way the diagnostics look this way and the person's not on medication anymore that, that's probably because you live in the united states <laughs> yep exactly uh, is there more to that often that uh, we have a neighbor who said he was healed he had problems with uh he was a honey said he couldn't even walk yeah. he couldn't even walk and uh they but they prayed for him they did a healing process uh, and he goes i was healed and yeah he's a very good christian <laughs> but really that's nice. why he was healed right no 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 <laughs> just checking no so Amber was probably hoping I was going to tell the story from India. I think so. I I'm not sure which story it is. I, I have one in mind that you told, but I'm yeah, sure you have many and you're all neck. good. You got the thing on his neck? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll tell this story and then I'll conclude my part for this morning and take a break until 2.30. Um, <clears throat> so this has got a little bit of interesting background to it. So sorry if this story takes me more than three minutes, but... Uh, I was asked to travel with a group of evangelists. It was a team. Um, there was a, a, a set of parent, a pastor and his wife, and then his two children who were both nurses, uh, adult children who were both nurses. And then a couple other people uh, that were just uh, working people in the community that came along on this trip, and then uh, myself and, and my wife. And um, so at the beginning of this, uh, I was a little troubled about uh, how to answer the pastor's question when he asked me if I would please come on this mission trip. And I, I had no question about, did I want to go to India? I, of course, want to go to India. But I was a little troubled about, but what are we going to be teaching again? And so he and I had a discussion about, yeah, then they're going to do the normal um, Amazing Facts seminar and all this. And, and I told him, well, I just got to be honest with you. I can't help you present any of that stuff. Uh, and I told him why. I explained how I didn't, I didn't agree with our gospel uh, being about uh, criticizing and condemning others, but rather uh, pointing out sin and the way to be saved from sin. And if we had to, uh, you know, and it was interesting because in India, which I did get to teach at the seminary there, so I learned a few things while I was helping at the seminary. They had like 70 uh, young men there who were wanting to learn to be uh, pastors and evangelists <clears throat> at the seminary. And I did learn that they had no real understanding of, of who the Pope was and all of that. Like, like they didn't, never heard of that before. Because to them, uh, in their environment, they had Hinduism, they had Sikh religion, and they had uh, different forms of Christianity, a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and so their, uh, their um, things they were facing as far as truth and error had to do with monkey gods and uh, frog gods and the cow and, and all kinds of stuff right so but 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 the thing from Europe they didn't they didn't know anything about that so I didn't know that before I went but I, I was clear about that I wished we could find a way to present uh, the mark of the beast and these different things uh, from a gospel perspective that wasn't just spending our whole time tearing down uh, other people or pointing out some particular group even if we expanded that to you know, multiple groups through history would help. But anyway, long and short of it is, I, I was assured that what, I, what he wanted me to come for was not to do presentations at the uh, meet, public meetings, but to lead the devotions for the team. I thought, well, that's a little bit different. Uh, yeah, I'd like to do that, actually. So, so we worked on, uh, from our first day in India, we were working on this Go Teach All Nations chapter. Uh, we started at the beginning. I took us uh, three days, three mornings as a group to read through it. Um, but we read all this stuff that I just highlighted for you guys today about 
Um, the power of the gospel, the, the, the power of miracles, is, the gospel still possesses the same power today. God wants to do these things today. We read all that stuff. But it was also in connection with what the true message was in that chapter. And I was just asking us to read it and pray about it together because we were going to be in an environment that was very much like in Jesus' time, meaning primitive, meaning, uh, you know, their house, they had like a 20-foot by 10-foot house, a lot of them in the village, and one half of it was for their family, uh, could be a husband, wife, and six kids, and the other half was for the cow. And uh, so it was very much a, what we'd call a primitive type of environment, but also a great environment where faith could exist because the people have so little. So we're reading this, and I was just hoping that it would spark some, some thinking and maybe some praying and maybe even some repenting of what we thought we were here to do and, and switching of directions. Anyway, getting to the point of the story. We go out to the village the very first night we're out there. We had been in India about three days. We get out there to get started on, and, and so the pastor's setting up the slide projector, the video projector, and getting ready inside the building. And, and my job uh, was just to uh, visit with the people, which I like best. So I was outside, and I observed as a man, in a local, uh, and I hadn't met any of these people yet, so I didn't know who this was, but he was approaching the two nurses of our group. And as he approached, I saw him pointing at his neck, and there was a very large, almost softball size uh, thing sticking out of his neck right here, a big sort of, I didn't know what it was. Uh, but anyway, I thought, well, that looks kind of odd. And then he's gesturing to them, and there's a translator. And then pretty soon I see uh, the daughter of the pastor. She then walks and goes into the, the building where her dad is setting up. And I thought, oh, good, she's going to go ask her dad for help. And he's the evangelist, right? He's here, so this is a good thing for him. Uh, but pretty soon I see her coming out of the building and walking straight towards me. And instantly I'm thinking, oh, her dad told her to go talk to me, right? So I'm in my mind praying, Lord, what do we, what do, we do with this? What's going on? What's the plan? I don't, I don't know the plan. I don't have a plan, but if there is one, I'd like to know. <clears throat> so she comes up to me and she says, oh, my dad said that I should come get you to come help us. And I said, okay, help with what? And she said, well, there's this guy over here talking to us, and he's asking you know, for someone to pray for him to be healed. I said, oh, okay, so are you and your husband going to do that? And she said, well, that's why we came to get you. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, okay, so we're, we're not yet grabbing on to what God wants to do, right? We're, we're, we're nurses, but we don't know what to do with this thing on the guy's neck. We're, we're here to preach uh, a message, but we, we don't really understand when someone comes and asks, what do you do with that? So I'm praying in my mind, Lord, I don't, I don't know, what, what, whatever your plan is, is good with me. But I walk over and I ask uh, now her husband, what's going on and what's happening? He explains to me and I said, well, so do you think we should, uh, what do you think we should do? And he said, well, we should at least pray for him. And I'm hearing, you know, all kinds of unbelief, all kinds. We don't have faith. And so I, I'm, as I'm asking the Lord, uh, I was inspired to pray like this. So we bowed our heads and, and I prayed, Lord, we don't know what your will is. Uh, we'd like to know what your will is. We're here in India to do mission work and to present the gospel to the people. So if it be your will, would you please help this man? Now, that was not what I believed. That was not what I was hoping for. That was what as a group, we were. So I was reiterating what, what our thinking was. <clears throat> well, so then the nurses felt like we were done. And so they kind of walked away. And uh, so I was left there talking through a translator to this man just a little bit, not too much, but obviously nothing happened, he leaves. So <clears throat> we kept in our devotions, studying and reading about this more uh, for at least another three or four days. Um, and then an interesting thing happened. Uh, I started, Kimmy and I started being asked to go visit people in their homes. So we'd show up and while they're setting up the meeting, we would be taken by, um, there was an elder, uh, as I understood, an elder of the village and his daughters uh, would take turns. One would do the chores for both of them that night while the other one would take us from house to house. 
and we go into these houses and <clears throat> on the walls of the house there would be four different um, pictures or images usually sometimes three but you'd have uh, Jesus on this wall and then you have Hare Krishna on that wall and then you have uh, a Buddha over here I mean it was like you know so these were covering all our bases but <clears throat> The people would say to us, you have come to teach us about Jesus. Uh, could you bless our home? I, I didn't even know what, it, what are they asking for. Like, that was, that was a different thought to me. I never heard of that. <clears throat> Nobody ever asked me to do that. And they would hand us their children. And so we're holding these three and four-year-olds or whatever. What do they want us to put hands on, you know, touch their children and bless their home? So it took me a couple a minute to think about that and go, wait, what are they asking for? So I decided, well, <clears throat> what we're going to do is I'd point at the picture of Jesus and I'd say, this is the God who, who I serve. And then I would pray over their home. They were very happy, very excited. They just thought that was the most wonderful thing. And they would want to give us food, which we really weren't supposed to eat in case we got get sick. But <clears throat> we had to eat some anyway, uh, just to be nice and never got sick. But this kind of kept happening. Every night, we'd go to more homes. And <clears throat> so about three nights before we were done in this village, uh, our translator, her name was Suki, uh, and she starts pointing over here. And I'm like, whoa, what's she, what's she looking at? And here comes this guy. Same guy with this thing on his neck. Only now we're not by the church. We're not around any of the people, uh, meaning the, the evangelists. We're kind of way out here in the village uh, amongst some homes and a very large crowd and like 30 children all around going with us, holding our hands as we go. And uh, this guy walked up to us and he walked straight up and looked at me and he said, could you please ask Jesus to heal me? So the translator is telling me this. And so now the only thought I had was to ask him through the translator, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And the answer came back, yes, I do know who he is, and I know you are here as a servant of his. Well, nobody ever said something like that to me before. So <clears throat> all I knew to say was, then go. The Lord will heal you. And I'm, as it's coming out of my mouth, speaking of my faith, I'm, I'm panicking. I'm thinking, well, who, should I have even have said that? I shouldn't have said that. How do I know? Uh, so I wondered, and I worried a little bit, and I prayed about it. Well, the next day, or the day just before our last, it was going to be our last day out there, Kim and I uh, took the bus, and we went out there three hours early because we were going to have way too many homes to go to. So sure enough, as we're walking around, Suki's sister, Shabnab, I think was her name, was with us, and she gets all excited. She's jumping up and down and pointing, and I'm like, what? I'm trying to figure out what she's pointing at, and here comes a man, and he walks up to us. <clears throat> And he's pointing at his neck, and he's saying, thank you. And I'm trying to figure out who this is. Well, they, they all looked similar enough to me. You know, I couldn't always tell the difference of who's who. So I had to ask Shabna, who, who is this man? And she looks at me like, don't you know? And I said, you know, looking at her, waiting for her to answer. And, of course, she said, that's the man who asked you to, to pray for him, right? And sure enough, it's, it's gone. <clears throat> so... I tell you that to say that when we read this stuff in the Desire of Ages, I'm familiar with the fact that where I come from and my thinking doesn't match that either. It needs to go there. It needs to understand that and accept it better. And I do know that God will show up and he will do it. But he must lead. Uh, he must decide the timing. He must know the when and he will inspire you exactly what words to say. But don't be afraid of it. Don't say, well, I got to get perfect before I can ask the Lord for this. In fact, uh, Ellen White says, uh, to use her words, um, we should be asking for this now. We should be asking the Lord to do what needs to be done in our lives now so he can do this work through us. So there you go, Amber. That's, that's one story that I have. And that's probably one of my favorite ones. But, but it's a story good. That's a good story because it, it interacts those components of our unbelief and our belief and what is it. And it's not about believing in miracle power. It's about working for the miracle worker. And that's to me the difference.
Is that, is that the one you wanted to name? That was good. That was exactly the one. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, love you guys. I'm going to leave you and take a break here, and I'll be back at 2.30, which uh, we won't really leave this subject at 2.30. We're just going to go on to uh, another aspect of it that has to do with our confusion about faith and work. So, so we'll work on it from that perspective. Okay. Happy Sabbath, everybody. We'll see you after a little while. That was super helpful. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.